What's up everybody, this is Professor Keegan and I'm here with a lecture for our Thursday scheduled class this week. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to mention a few reminders for you. Um, these are things that I think are important for moving forward in the course. Um, they're also things that are getting pushed to me that I'm being asked to remind you about. Um, two important things that have come through just recently in the last 48 hours is one, we're being asked to really remind people <laughs> uh, if you are a finishing senior that you do need to apply to graduate. Now, I know not a lot of us in this course are um, seniors, but I do think some of you might actually be in this situation. So please don't forget that in order to actually finish your degree, you do need to actually apply for graduation. Um, and I believe you can, I don't know how that happens, but you should contact your advisor about it uh, if you haven't so far. Um, the second thing is, um, often we're running registration um, in a face-to-face -face way at this time at the university through your advisor. Um, however, because we're not face-to-face, -face, I'm going to take some extra effort here to remind you that you should be um, seeking out and registering for classes for uh, spring and summer as well as next year, right? It's, a, it's an annual calendar that we do this on. Um, so to ensure that you get seats in classes that you will absolutely need to stay on track, um, you should definitely register. Um, and you should utilize your advising office as well as your, your personal major advisor um, in that process. And lastly, again, um, I'm, I've been really pleased to see a lot of people kind of coming online and engaging with the materials on Blackboard uh, as we've been pushing through this uh, period, this week especially, getting kind of started and rolling with the remainder of the semester. Um, but if you're running into issues, problems, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'm here to support you and we're working together to make sure that we are making this class um, as effective an experience as possible. So those are just a few reminders for today's session. Um, and I'm just going to um, walk you through some of the content and and my um, my goal here today is to provide kind of a general overview of this of this time period that we're looking at now last class on Tuesday we watched United in Anger and we talked a bit about the impact of the AIDS crisis on uh, LGB mostly communities um, and today we're kind of detouring a bit to look at a chapter of Stryker's transgender history where she discusses the specific um, effects uh, on the trans community of this partic particular time in U.S. history. And this isn't often something that's paid attention to um, because so much of the focus during the AIDS crisis really is on gay men um, and then secondarily on lesbians. Um, and so what happened to trans communities in this period often goes missing and it's really crucial to understanding the current um, landscape of LGBTQ politics in the United States. Um, so we're going to be spending just a little bit of time unpacking that. So this is Unit 5 in our uh, syllabus, which is focusing on the AIDS crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an image of an ACT UP protest. Um, we, we've taken a close look at their work um, during the AIDS crisis last class. But now we're moving over to look at uh, Stryker's chapter, The Difficult Decades. We had, re we had last looked at trans history specifically when we covered the Compton's Cafeteria riot and the role transgender people played in the early uh, early wave of sort of gay liberation actions. Um, and then we've been focusing a lot on the fragmentation of the liberation movement around different kinds of policy positions. Um, and so today we're kind of like, what happened to trans issues and all of that, right? Um, so. The first thing to really note here, and Stryker um, emphasizes this in the piece, is that this chapter is really focusing on a 20-year period of history between 1970 and 1990, 91, where um, trans populations became politically isolated from the larger LGBTQ movement. Um, and there are a number of reasons why that happened. I think this is why Stryker calls it the difficult decades, because trans people kind of found themselves on, on their own in this period uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so the first thing to really understand is that a lot of these changes had to do with how medicine started thinking about transsexuality and transgenderism. Um, we had talked about the history of eugenics and um, 
the way in which LGBTQ people have been targeted for cures, right? And um, the way in which uh, LGBTQ identities have been medically pathologized in the United States. And that was certainly something that was directed primarily at first at homosexuality as a, as a medical classification. We talked about this when we looked at the 1950s, um, but by 1973, gay activists, um, gay white male activists particularly, have been very successful in fighting the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, to get uh, homosexuality removed from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. It was in there as a, a sort of mental disorder um, and so there's a campaign to normalize homosexuality, get it demedicalized, get it out of the DSM, which is great. That's it's something that needed to happen. Um, it's, a, it's a very oppressive history, that history. But what happens is that as that takes place, um, this other kind of disorder is added in the subsequent edition of the DSM, the 1980 edition. Um, this is it right here, DSM-3. Uh, and so what we see is a kind of transition from thinking about homosexuality as the major issue that was, that's like the major disordered sexuality to transsexuality as, a, as the major disorder. And so um, we've talked a bit before about kind of how there's a hierarchy in the LGBTQ community. And we see here how gay and lesbian identifications are being normalized. Um, which is, which is great, but kind of at the expense of trans identities who are then being slotted into the stigmatized position in the mental health field. And so what we see is an increasing normalization of gay and lesbian identities and trans identities are medically stigmatized in, in contrast to those. So it starts to be the trans person or trans identities that are the site of a lot of anxiety, uh, gendered anxiety and, 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 and panic almost. Um, and so we start to see shifts in who is, is considered normal. Um, along with this come some really devastating changes uh, to American healthcare that really negatively impact trans communities. So we looked when we watched Screaming Queens, we saw how uh, the gender clinics were starting to open up. We talked about how Reed Erickson had contributed millions and millions of dollars to building the sort of public infrastructure of trans healthcare in the United States. Uh, all those researchers, all those gender clinics had opened. People could qualify for free surgery if they went through a screening process. Well, by 1980, what happens is that that we've started to privatize U.S. healthcare. The Reagan administration comes in and starts to privatize and defund all the federal money for these programs, um, and the uh, anti-poverty programs of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, which people were using to access surgery, um, there were there were bans placed on those programs. They could no longer be used to access gender transition. So that happened, and then along with that, we have a nationwide uh, move to defund gender clinics, close them, and force trans people into the private healthcare system. But unfortunately, even though being trans was classified as a as a disease or disorder medical insurance was not was not forced to cover medical transition. This is still the case today in our country. Uh, people are still being classified with gender dysphoria, um, but many, many, many insurance companies do not cover anything related to that um, classification. So this leaves trans people in a really tight spot where to get access to care, you have to get diagnosed with something, but then once you're diagnosed, you can't actually use that diagnosis to pay to get anything covered or paid for. That is the conundrum we're still in. So understanding those changes and how they were impacting trans people specifically is really important. Secondarily, we also have in the LGBTQ community the emergence of new post-Stonewall gender norms that cause trans people to be less accepted in those communities. So um, a really key problem that, that comes up that Stryker covers is how transgender people had had these alliances or, or sort of initial alliances or strategic alliances, we could say, with LGB movements. We saw that when we looked at Stonewall, we looked at Compton's, um, but also with feminism, 
because some feminist communities were in in the late 60s early 70s really thinking about the issue of trans people as being related to the oppression of, of cis women and that these were both kinds of gender oppression that needed to be worked on uh, simultaneously but by the mid 70s that starts to shift and the trans community starts to lose those key alliances so um, what happens is that as uh, gay and lesbian people start to get considered normal uh, and get accepted into more mainstream culture, their, those internal cultures start to develop new gender norms and gender nonconformity starts to be a problem. Uh, we saw this when um, in Outrage 69, um, someone says, you know, drag queens are the worst example of gayness and we need to kind of get rid of them because, you know, they represent this tiny little fraction of the gay community and but they and they represent us in a really bad light and everyone thinks we're just like them and we're we just want to be normal. Right. We can start to see that attitude spreading um, and that gender nonconformity starts to be rejected in uh, LGBT cultures. And so these new norms for inclusion are starting to develop what we might call homonormativity, which we've covered in class already, the idea that there are norms for gayness and lesbianness that are acceptable ways of being gay and lesbian that are tolerable to straight culture. So what happens in gay male culture? We have an increasing celebration of hypermasculinity um, and straight passing types of masculinity um, and a real celebration of, of manliness. And we have the development of what becomes known as the Castro clone look, um, which by the late 70s was really the dominant uh, style for gay men in the United States. It's a very hyper-masculine butch look. And you can see how um, this would not be great if you were a more femme-presenting male-assigned person, or if you were a drag queen, or if you were a trans woman. Um, those types of expressions are less acceptable in gay male culture after the mid 70s. And on the other side of the coin, in lesbian culture, um, pre Stonewall, there was more of a celebration of gender polarity. So there were butch and femme relationships there that by the mid 70s start to be rejected uh, because of lesbian feminism. So a bunch of lesbian women are saying, well, why are, why are we having these roles that seem to be kind of like straight people's roles? Um, are butches oppressing femmes? Is this an oppressive relationship? Um, and so what we see is a new kind of norm for lesbian culture of a kind of androgyny, a blending of masculinity and femininity. Um, so you can see here also how um, having a strong adherence to a gender role, say if you're a, a sort of masculine woman or a, a butch woman or a trans man who's being kind of tolerated in lesbian culture, um, suddenly your masculinity is not going to be as acceptable. So these things start to be reasons why trans people start getting pushed out of these spaces. And then we also looked at how some second wave feminism, feminisms are beginning to view trans people as part of the problem with gender. They're starting to think of trans people as these kinds of um, conservative people who adhere to gender norms and roles and rather than um, overcoming gender, want to embrace gender, and that starts to be seen as really retrograde by certain feminist communities. And some feminists even think of trans women as sort of like secret agents of the state who are trying to like infiltrate their spaces, their collectives, and ruin them and take them over, um, which was really happening to a lot of left communities. The FBI was sending people into these um, enclaves and these radical movements to to uh, bust them from inside. Um, this even happened to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so it was a it was based on real fear, but trans women start getting thought of as collaborating with this effort to undermine feminism, in a way that was just really misguided. And so uh, Stryker discusses Janice Raymond's *The Transsexual Empire* as a book that really kind of solidified that kind of feminist thinking about trans people particularly trans women, and really set the whole movement back. Uh, and we still have not really overcome these issues. So lost alliances uh, with these key groups cause some effects. Um, they really lead to, in many ways, our current situation where what we have is kind of, we have LGB politics, and then the T is just kind of like tacked on as an afterthought often. And 
um, gay and lesbian issues do tend to really still run the, the conversation and bi people and to even a lesser extent trans people are less accepted and their issues are less centered in the community because of these shifts and changes. So these problems that arise between 1970 and 1990, early 1990s um, really do give us the current landscape of LGBTQ politics today. Um, this is an example just from 2016 of a change.org petition that was posted called Drop the T, which was literally a group of uh, cisgender gay men and lesbians who believed that transgender people should be completely disassociated with the gay rights movement. You can see here they write, we are a group of gay slash bisexual men and women who have come to the conclusion that the transgender community needs to be disassociated from the larger, larger LGB community. In essence, we ask that organizations such as the Human Rights Campaign, GLAAD, Lambda Legal, and media outlets such as The Advocate, Out, HuffPost, Gay Voices, etc. stop representing the transgender community as we feel their ideology is not only completely different from that promoted by the LGB community, LGB is about sexual orientation and trans is about gender identity, but is ultimately regressive and actually hostile to the goals of women and gay men. Um, this attitude is still around and it's very much informed by the conditions I described on the, on the former slide. So this is all still very much with us. So what happens is that trans people in this period are increasingly isolated from LGB culture and spaces. They're also no longer directly advocated for by either LGB or feminist politics. So there's like a dual exclusion happening where like all of the spaces where this work was getting done suddenly become more hostile and less inclusive to trans people. And that's really devastating. I think Stryker even mentions how there was an opportunity to combine trans medical justice with Roe v. Wade and abortion access. And that just didn't happen because of these attitudes in the feminist community. So we have a kind of double negative situation going on where both sides are saying we don't really want you around your issues aren't related to our issues and this results in you know really negative outcomes for the trans community in terms of increased poverty uh, lack of medical care right we see how all the medical systems start to shut down and exclude trans people and this drives the need to engage in survival based economies like sex work um, and also to get uh, hormone access, right? Um, injecting hormones off the street or on the street, sharing needles to do that. You can see how these conditions would produce um, not only an increased incarceration rate for, LG uh, for trans people, but also uh, skyrocketing HIV transmission. Um, and so we need to think about, even though trans people aren't often represented in AIDS history, or AIDS crisis history, certainly trans people were on the front lines of this disease in terms of risk factors and sort of the political infrastructure of the time. Now, um, just because most histories of the AIDS crisis ignore transgender populations does not mean trans people were not engaging in AIDS activism. In fact, we were. Um, I think even in um, one of the videos we watched, it mentions that Marsha P. Johnson was a member of ACT UP, right? So we know that these communities were still working together in, in some ways. Um, however, there were these broader structural shifts that caused these risk factors for trans people. Um, one really important person that uh, Stryker covers in this chapter that I wanted to put a finger down on, because some of you have asked, where are all the trans men, right? Which is a great question. Um, trans men were often kind of hanging out in these lesbian communities where their masculinity was accepted as a kind of butchness. And when these new androgynous politics came in, trans men found themselves on the outs um, and needed to form their own communities and networks. And so Lou Sullivan um, was really important to that effort to build an international transgender men's community and culture. He was a gay transgender man um, and one thing he was really important in pushing through was the distinction between gender identity and sexual orientation, which was not commonly recognized until the late 60s, early 70s. Um, because 
he wanted to transition, but he was also gay. And those were things that were not considered to be possible by doctors, right? The whole idea was if you transition, you come out as a straight person. You could be gay or you could transition and be straight, but you couldn't transition and be gay. That was something that they weren't interested in permitting. Um, and so Lou fought the medical, uh, the medical establishment about this and he won and got access to medical transition. Um, this is Lou. Uh, he was super important to trans male history. He created FTM Inter International, um, a network through which he sent information about medical trans transition to trans men all over the globe um, through uh, pamphlets, leaflets, audio recordings. Um, and he also helped found the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco, which is the exact place in Screaming Queens where we see Stryker discover the Compton's Cafeteria Riot. So we think about his role in creating a space where history can be collected and archived. We're going to be thinking about archives more next week as a crucial way to resist some of these erasures that are going on with this mass kind of extinction event during the AIDS crisis. Um, so Sullivan was really important to creating this archive. Um, and he also was an archivist. So he actually recorded his experience uh, as a transgender gay man in San Francisco in his diaries. And if you go to the GLBT, the GLBT Historical Society, it's like nine feet of diaries. Like he just obsessively documented everything about his life. And later in his life, uh, in 1986, he was diagnosed with AIDS and responded to this by becoming an AIDS activist and actually went on public television to educate people about the disease. And so um, to close out today's session, I have a really quick video from the We've Been Around series about Lou. When Lou Sullivan moved to California in 1975, he knew exactly who he was and what kind of life he wanted. If there was any city that would accept a transgender man who loved other men, it was San Francisco. But when he arrived, the gatekeepers to Lou's medical transition blocked his path to becoming the man he was meant to be. I had a lot of problems with the uh, gender professionals saying there is no such thing as a female to gay male, and you can't live like this, and we've never heard of that. Lou knew who he was. His friends and partners did too. It was the gender professionals who stood in the way. Once again, I uh, applied to the gender clinics uh, saying, hey, I've uh, been living full time as a male now for six years and uh, it's all been working out. Everything's been fine. I can do it. I'm being a gay man and uh, I need to have this bottom surgery. I finally have the money for it. And uh, once again, was told that uh, case was too unusual, that they had never heard of a female to male who wanted to be a gay man, that they did not want to be the first to operate and deal with such a, a person. Trans men weren't supposed to be gay. Since Lou was assigned female at birth, in the eyes of the medical establishment, he could either be a man or be attracted to men, but not both. But Lou knew otherwise. My gender identity, who I think I am, has nothing to do with what I'm looking for in a sexual partner. After being rejected by the gender clinics, he bypassed the establishment and finally had the surgery he had long sought. Lou became a leader in the trans masculine community. He organized support groups, counseled other trans men, wrote books, maintained an archive of resources and materials for the trans community, and helped found the GLBT Historical Society. He lived a full life as a gay man and took advantage of everything San Francisco had to offer. But like many gay men of the era, Lou tested positive for HIV. He received his AIDS diagnosis on New Year's Eve, 1986. Lou's diagnosis was a further call to action. His writings and research took on a heightened sense of urgency. Lou had grown up without anyone who looked like him, lived like him, and loved like him. He wanted to ensure that gay trans men would have a forefather to look back on to know that they weren't alone, that the life they wanted was possible. And in a way, I, I don't even feel bad about having AIDS. In a way, uh, I, I feel it's almost a poetic justice because AIDS is still seen at this point as a gay man's disease, that it, it kind of proves that I did do it and I was successful. And, uh, and I kind of took a perverse 
pleasure in uh, contacting the gender clinics that rejected me and said, uh, uh, you know, that uh, they've told me so many years that it was impossible for me to live as a gay man, but it looks like I'm going to die like one. Lou died of AIDS-related complications in 1991. He lived with AIDS for five years, long past his prognosis. Lou's story is just one of the many untold histories of trans pioneers who have lived, loved, and died in this country. We've been around. Okay, so one key thing to take away from this, I think, is that um, we think of LGB and T as these like separate groups, but really the intersectionality of these identities means that there were trans people who were also <laughs> gay, right, and are, and and so the uh, lose life is one really important example of how those categories don't break down along narrow lines. Um, so. Uh, that's all I have for today, and um, we'll be touching base next week when we uh, think about the archive. We're looking at the ACT UP Oral History Project, and we're also watching a film called Real in the Closet about LGBTQ home movies and how they are one way of responding to the kinds of historical erasures that we've been discussing in class. So I'll leave it there, and I hope you're all doing well. Please do reach out if you need anything from me, and I'll see you on Blackboard. Okay.